Hello everybody, my name is Rachel and welcome back to my channel. So the case that I have for you today is about an absolutely amazing woman who overcame one of the most horrific and unimaginable crimes that you can go through. It does get a bit graphic at times, so I tried my best to avoid any unnecessary graphic detail, but some of the details of this case are really important to talk about, so this is your warning now. I only say that because this is probably one of the most disturbing videos that I have ever done on this channel so it is a little bit more of a sensitive topic and so again if you're sensitive to that this is your warning but before we get into the video i wanted to go ahead and say a huge thank you to today's sponsor magic spoon you guys know that i'm always looking for a way to add a healthy snack to my routine that doesn't add any unnecessary sugar magic spoon is a great way to do that they have cereal that's completely reinvented magic spoon cereals have zero grams of sugar 13 to 14 grams of protein and only four net carbs per serving, which is great for me because I'm a vegetarian and I'm also a picky eater. So it's really hard for me to find protein sources throughout my day and I basically live off of carbs. They are keto-friendly, grain-free, gluten-friendly, and GMO-free, so they can fit into pretty much any diet. Their variety pack comes with four delicious flavors, cocoa, fruity, frosted, and peanut butter. I love to eat my cereal each morning when I wake up or sometimes I throw it into a baggie and take it with me as a snack. My favorite flavor has to be the fruity one, but I also love the cocoa as a very close second. But the frosted and peanut butter ones are also so amazing. My boyfriend loves the frosted one and my roommate loves the peanut butter one. I love the cereals at Magic Spoon and it's a great way to boost your diet with a little bit of added protein without the added sugar. So if you want to go ahead and give it a try, make sure you go ahead and click the link down below and use code RSHANNON to get $5 off of your order. Magic Spoon is so confident in their cereals that it is backed with a 100% happiness guarantee. So if you don't like your order for whatever reason, they will refund your money, no questions asked. So there really is no reason not to give it a try. So again, make sure you click the link down below and use code RACHELSHANNON for $5 off of your order. Which flavors are you going to try? Thank you again to Magic Spoon for sponsoring today's video. So with all of that being said, let's get into the video. Today, we are going to be discussing the very disturbing case of Alison Botha. Alison Botha was born on September 22nd, 1967 in Port Elizabeth, South Africa. She seemed to have a relatively normal childhood as far as I saw, but her parents got divorced when she was 10 years old, so she lived most of her life with her mother Claire and her brother Neil. She was described as others by confident and adventurous, but she sort of described herself as ordinary, not really standing out too much, and she didn't really have a set direction in her life that she wanted to go in for quite a while. She went to school and was the head girl at the Collegiate High School for Girls in Port Elizabeth. She went to university for a secretarial degree, and when she graduated, she spent about four years traveling around before she returned home to Port Elizabeth to settle down and start a career as an insurance broker. Now, Sunday, December 18th, 1994, started as a pretty normal day for 27-year-old Allison. She had gone to the beach for the day with some friends before they headed back to Allison's apartment for some pizza and to play a game called Balderdash. All the friends friends had a pretty fun day before her friends decided to call it a night at around 1 a.m. Earlier, Allison had actually offered to drive one of her friends, Kim, home, so she went ahead and did that and then returned back to her apartment. Now, normally, Allison had a pretty nice parking spot in her apartment complex, which was only a short walk away from her unit. However, when she got home, she realized that the spot had actually been taken, so she had to drive around and search for a new one that wasn't too far away. And eventually, she did find a spot, but the spot spot was right under a big tree, and the area was already pretty poorly lit, and this tree just blocked the light even more, so it was pretty dark where she had ended up parking. But at this point, she was pretty tired and was ready to just head upstairs, take a shower, and go to bed. So she had reached over in her car to grab the laundry bag out of the passenger side of her car before heading out to the apartment. However, as she was doing so, she was leaned over in the passenger seat grabbing the bag. She suddenly felt a warm gush of air. She looked over only to see that a tall, skinny white man with blonde hair had swung the door open and was now standing there with a knife. And it was her driver's side door, so she was faced away from him when he opened the door. So after this, he leaned over to her and said in a quiet but very serious tone, 
move over or I'll kill you. So she did exactly that. She moved over to the passenger seat of her car. After she moved, this man got into the driver's seat of the car and just started driving. Of course, Allison was absolutely terrified and completely frozen in fear. But after a few minutes of driving, this man introduced himself as Clinton and assured her by saying, I don't want to hurt you. I just need to use your car for an hour. And of course, Allison really didn't know what to think, but she wanted to believe him. She went through all of these different scenarios in her head. She thought of maybe just jumping out of the car, doing something, but she was just frozen. She just begged the man to please just let her out of the car. She said that, you know, you can take the car just to let her go, but he said no. He told her that he was looking for someone who owed him money and that he wouldn't be long in what he had to do. So the man drove for a little bit longer before arriving in a different area of Port Elizabeth. Once he got there, he finally found the person that he had been searching for. He pulled over and told this man to get into his car. He introduced this man to Allison as Thuns and told Thuns that this was his new friend, Allison. After Thuns got into the car, Clinton drove to the outskirts of Port Elizabeth to an area that was completely isolated. It was a very desolate area in the bush with absolutely nothing around. At this point, Allison knew that something horrible was about to happen to her, but nobody could have predicted the level of brutality and violence that she was about to endure. So Clinton, whose real name was actually Fran de Tweet, and Thuns told Allison that they were going to have sex with her and asked her if she was going to fight them. Obviously, she was trapped. She was isolated. There was absolutely nowhere for her to go and she was absolutely terrified. So she told them no, she wasn't going to fight them. What happens next is very disturbing. It's very graphic and very violent. So I just wanted to go ahead and warn you now because it is very difficult to hear. But after this, both of them brutally raped Allison one after the other. After that, they tried to suffocate her until she fell unconscious. At this point, they had tried to kill her, but Allison was still alive despite them trying to suffocate her. So the two of them became very frustrated and the two started stabbing her. They stabbed her upwards of 36 times in the abdomen and they were actually trying to target her reproductive organs. After stabbing her, they thought that she was dead, but then her leg twitched and they realized that she was not dead yet. So they decided to take it a step further and they slit her throat 17 times. It was later described that as she was laying there on top of a bunch of broken glass and sand, the man was just standing above her and all she could see was his arms moving left and right and left and right over her face as he was slitting her throat. This entire time, she was completely aware of everything that was being done to her by these two men. Eventually, the two men stepped away and the two men looked at her and spoke to each other in Afrikaans. One man asked, do you think she's dead? And the other man replied, no one can survive that. At this point, Allison was still alive and as she heard them talking, she kept hearing this rasping sound. The sound was actually coming from her throat and from bleeding from her horrific injuries. To her, this noise sounded so loud. So she tried to do whatever she could to stop this noise because she was afraid that they would hear. But she also wanted to make sure that she stayed completely still because she didn't want them to know that she was still alive. But then as she was laying there, she felt something being thrown on her. She didn't know what it was, but at that point it didn't really matter. And so she just stayed and laid there and did not move a muscle. She just laid there until she heard them walk away and listened as their voices got more faint. And finally, she heard the men get into her car and drive away, leaving her completely alone to just die there. At this point, she was sure that she was going to die, so she took every last ounce of strength that she had to leave some clues around her about who did this to her. She had actually caught the names of both of these men throughout the attack because they just kept talking to each other. So so she at least knew the names of these two men. So she wrote their names in the sand and beneath that she wrote 
I love mom. She was just laying there wondering how she was going to possibly survive this. But then she saw headlights beaming through the bushes. It was a car on the road that was driving past her. This gave her the motivation that she needed to know that there was still a possibility that there was somebody out there who could help her. She had tried to get up, but she had been attacked so bad that her intestines were actually falling out of her abdomen. But she had noticed that the item that one of the men had thrown on her was actually her denim jacket. So she picked it up and used that to compress the area and control everything that was going on and put everything everything back inside. Then somehow she was able to get up. She managed to crawl through the dirt and all of the broken glass. As she was doing this though, she just kept getting more and more exhausted until she collapsed into the ground. But through this exhaustion, she just kept thinking of her mother and that gave her the strength to keep going. She kept crawling, but that was just taking way too much strength and way too much energy. So she managed to get up onto her feet to start walking, but once she was on her feet, she just fell back. And at that point, that's when she realized just how badly her throat had been cut. Her head fell back and she lost her vision. She had nearly been decapitated from how bad the injuries to her throat were. So she used one of her free hands to push her head back forward and she got her vision back. She literally had to use one free hand to keep her head on her neck and the other one to hold her denim jacket up on her abdomen to keep everything complete pressed. But she managed to do this and she managed to keep trudging forward towards the road. But as she was doing so, her vision was just going in and out and in and out until she eventually got to the road. Once she reached the road, she just collapsed onto the white line. She knew that her best bet was just to lay there and hopefully be noticed by someone who was driving by. There were actually two cars who had saw her and then slowed down next to her, but then just sped off. It's kind of disgraceful. But then, thankfully, there was another car on the road that did see Allison and did decide to stop. A 20-year-old man named Tian Ellard had gotten out of the car to see what was going on. Tian was a vet student from Johansonburg on vacation with some friends in Port Elizabeth at the time. He had gotten out of his car to help this woman and realized that she was still alive. He then used his veterinary experience to help stabilize everything and help keep her conscious. He covered her up and just kept talking to her this entire time to keep her awake. Thankfully, one of Tian's friends had a cell phone so they were able Able to call an ambulance for her. They actually ended up waiting 45 minutes to an hour. It's been reported a little bit differently, so I'm not exactly sure how long, but they waited for quite a while before an ambulance eventually arrived. So at that point, it kind of seemed like she was just dead. She wasn't going to survive and there was nothing that anybody could do to help her. Once she arrived at the hospital, doctors were absolutely horrified at her condition. Dr. Alexander Angelov went on to say, Say that in his 16 years as a doctor, he has never seen anybody with such severe injuries. She was on the brink of death and they were confident that there was no way that she was going to pull through. They described her condition as being absolutely filthy. Her entire body was covered in a thin layer of black dirt. Her eyes were just bloodshot, her hair was matted, her feet were lacerated, and her fingernails were completely black. Her neck had been cut all the way across. And like I said earlier, her head was barely hanging on. And also, like I said earlier, she had been stabbed 36 times in her abdomen and her pubic area. She ended up being in surgery for three hours. They actually had to wash her intestines in a saline solution before reorganizing them back into her and stitching her up. They reconstructed her neck and thankfully, somehow, by the grace of God, her attackers had missed her carotid artery and her esophagus. Your carotid artery is basically your lifeline. If that's cut, your brain is not going to have the blood and oxygen it needs. So if that had been cut, she definitely wouldn't have survived this, but thankfully they just didn't get it. It was absolutely incredible and she did end up surviving her surgery with minimal remaining impairments, but the doctors thought that she probably wasn't going to be able to go on to have kids due to the severity of the wounds. 
to her reproductive organs. But either way, she was conscious and she was able to vividly remember everything about her attack, including who the men were and what they looked like. So police brought Allison a book full of pictures of a bunch of different offenders from around the area and she was able to point them out right away. Now, these two men actually had a very concerning and infuriating history of sexual violence against women. So now I'm gonna go ahead and talk about the history of things leading up to Allison's attack. In February of 1994, Franz de Tweet did a similar thing to a 19-year-old girl. He surprised her too by opening up the door of her car and telling her to move to the passenger seat. He then drove to a secluded area and proceeded to rape her. He then drove to a nearby cafe and then got her dinner and gave her a rose. However, after this attack, he got her back into the car, drove her to another secluded location, and assaulted her once again. After that, he drove her back to the city and let her go. Of course, this young woman reported the rape and he was arrested, but he was released on bail. By early December of that year, both him and Thuns had approached a 21-year-old pregnant woman and then they threatened her with a gun, made her walk to a secluded area, and then they both raped her. They ended up letting her go too and she also reported the rape and they were both arrested, but of course, they were both released shortly after. At this point, the judge said that he didn't know that Franz had the other rape charge, but it didn't really matter because they should have never been released in the first place. This was a violent attack, doesn't matter if it's their first time or not. I can just never understand how a judge can see two men who literally held a woman at gunpoint, especially a pregnant woman, and then raped her and thought, hmm, they're probably not going to do it again, so let's just let them out and await their trial. Because then, as we know, two weeks after they were released on bail, in December of 1994, the two kidnapped raped and attempted to murder Allison Botha. When they did this to Allison, they knew that they couldn't just leave her alive because the other two women had reported their rapes and they didn't want to get caught this time. So they figured we need to kill her this time to make sure we don't get caught. It's absolutely ridiculous and it's very predictable. Yet somehow this judge didn't think that that would happen and just let them out. It's absolutely appalling and I really hope things have changed in South Africa. So now going back to when Allison had woken up from surgery, she was able to remember exactly what her attackers looked like and she identified them right away. So shortly after this, police were able to locate them and they were arrested. So Fence Kruger was the first to be interviewed and when he was given the news that he was being charged with attempted murder and rape, he was very surprised. The two were very confident that they had killed her, but as we know, they hadn't. So right away, Thuns handed over the knife that they used for Allison's attack, as well as the jewelry that they had stolen from her. Franz was then questioned as well, and he too admitted everything. They both showed absolutely zero emotion or remorse for anything that they had done, and they actually informed police that they had planned on raping another woman the very next day, and they were going to throw her off of a bridge. Then the two came out and said that the reason that they were committing all of these disgusting and horrific crimes was because they were involved in Satanism. They said that they were possessed by demons and these demons were the ones who were telling them to do all of these crimes. And of course, the media ran wild with this. This was around the time in the early 90s when the satanic panic was running rampant in South Africa. In 1992, they had actually created a task force that was responsible specifically for crimes related to the occult. So it was kind of obvious that the two were just using all of this panic and media out rage to make up excuses for what they did and try to blame it on some random demons, but nobody believed them. Then after the men were arrested, of course, they went to trial. Obviously, the prosecution had a very strong case against them. They had all of the evidence from that night as well as Allison's testimony. By August of 1995, both of them were found guilty of eight charges, which included two counts of kidnapping, two counts of indecent assault, two counts of rape, 
one count of aggravated robbery, and one count of attempted murder. The two are being charged with Allison's assault and then the assault on the pregnant woman that we discussed earlier. Franz de Tweet was handed three life sentences and Thens Kruger was handed a life sentence plus 25 years. The judge made it very clear that he wanted these two men behind bars for the rest of their lives. So now rewinding just a little bit, Allison had stayed in the hospital for three weeks and she was recovering from her injuries. While she was there, news about her attack was spreading all around South Africa and support for her came absolutely pouring in. Thousands of people sent her cards and letters and flowers. Everybody admired her grit and her strength. People had come to visit her in the hospital and they were absolutely horrified at her condition, but apparently she was just sitting there and cracking jokes and had such a positive attitude. It was absolutely incredible. After she left the hospital, she did get to go home, but her care was not done there. She had to go back to the hospital pretty much every day for continued care for her surgical sites so that she wouldn't have any infections or any further complications. It was a very slow, painful, and grueling process, but she made it through. But even though she had recovered and the men responsible had been put behind bars, Allison still had so many things Things she had to deal with as a result of the attack. She wasn't able to work and she fell into a very severe and deep depression. She didn't know how she was going to continue on with her life after this. So she decided to take what happened to her and speak out and share her story. She quit her job with the insurance firm and started traveling all around the world to tell her story in so many different countries. She was actually one of the first women from South Africa to speak speak out publicly about rape. Her story inspired so many other survivors to come forward and share their stories. By 1995, she won the Rotarian Paul Harris Award for Courage Beyond the Norm, as well as the Femina Magazine's Woman of Courage Award. She was also later honored as Port Elizabeth's Citizen of the Year. She also went on to get married to Tiani Botha in February of 1997. Her and Tiani had actually known each other for many years, but about a year after her attack, the two had met again at a friend's house. The two connected because both had experiences of trauma. Tiani had unsolved childhood trauma that he was still battling and Allison was battling her own depression. The two were able to help each other out of their own personal darknesses and through that, they fell in love and they knew that they wanted to spend the rest of their lives together. Then by November 14th of 2003, she gave birth to her son, Daniel, and then went on to have another baby boy named Matthew a few years after that. She also went on to publish two books. One was called I Have a Life, Allison's Journey as Told by Marion Tham and published in 1998. She then went on to publish her book, For the Tough Times, in 2002. She also has a movie about her attack, which came out in 2016. She continued traveling all over the country to tell her story, and so many people have come out to her and told her that her story inspired them. And some people have even said that her story has saved their life because they feel less alone in their own personal experiences of violence and rape. She once said, quote, Life can sometimes make us feel like the victim. Problems and hardships and traumas are dished out to all of us, and sometimes they can be divided very unfairly. Remind yourself that you do not have to take responsibility for what others do. Life is not a collection of what happens to you, but how have you responded to what has happened to you? She chooses not to live her life as a victim and used what happened to her as a motivating factor to do better for herself and help as many people people as she can along the way. People have often asked me, well, what made me survive? What made me fight? And if I've only got it to give them a sentence, the sentence is, because I was worth giving up for. Because I was worth fighting for. And that, ladies and mothers, is not something that I was told then and then at that moment. My mother was not with me at that moment. And you as mothers are not going to be with your children when they face their darkest hour. All they're going to have from you is what you've implanted in them when you bring them up. All you're going to have in your times when you've got the spare time moment in your own life is what you've planted in it now when things are going okay. 
So don't just waste the time when things are going okay. Nurture it in yourself. Show your children by example what it means to live a life of worth. That I see worth in myself. Now, of course, that goes to that everyone else is just as worthy as you, so you've got to have that empathy, which is huge for me as well. But just my core thing that I know saved my life. Start with you. Don't ignore you. Alison Botha is truly a, such an inspiration, and I can't even imagine the courage that it takes to talk about such a horrific incident in front of millions of people like she has. Even alone, just the fact that she survived this entire thing is absolutely incredible and shows how much of a freaking fighter she is. She was not going to give up, and she continues to this day to show just how strong she is. But she's also helped so many people come forward with their own experiences and has taught millions of young women how to cope with what they've personally gone through and that's truly amazing. But that is all I have for today's video. I'm really excited to see what you guys have to say about this case and about Allison and her amazing courage. I'm so excited to have that discussion in the comments below. If you liked this video, please make sure to go ahead and give this video a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel. I put out new true crime and mystery videos every week. Don't forget to turn on the notification bell to be notified of any of my future videos. Also, don't forget to go ahead and follow me on Twitter and Instagram. And if you have absolutely any case suggestions, please make sure to go ahead and send them over to my email at rachelshannoncases at gmail.com. Every single case that I cover here on my channel comes directly from there or my Patreon. So make sure you go ahead and send those suggestions over. With that, I hope you guys have a great week. Stay safe, stay healthy, and I hope to see you next time. Bye.